So in this video, I want to talk a bit more about the recent update to the Pocket 4K and basically the new recording mode that that update allows you to do. It gives quite a few updates to the Pocket 4K, but the one we're looking at is the 2.6K Super 16 recording mode. So what this is, is just a crop of the sensor and it allows you to use Super 16 lenses without any light loss or vignetting around the edge of frame. The thing is though, not many people have Super 16 lenses. I think for a lot of people, they're gonna end up using this mode just for the updated 120 frames a second in the 2.6K resolution. So this got me thinking as the original Pocket Cinema camera had a Super 16 sensor that's roughly the same size as this new Super 16 crop. And I remembered that Metabones actually came out with a speed booster that took the original Pocket Cinema camera from the Super 16 up to an almost APS-C field of view. So these adapters came out back in 2014. So they're about five, nearly six years old now and they're gonna be hard to come by new. I did have a look online and there were some websites selling them new, but most likely you're gonna find them secondhand through sites like kind of Gumtree or eBay or things like that. I really wanted to try one of these out as that would be quite a cool thing to have for the Pocket 4K. But before I got one, they are still quite expensive. I decided to kind of check all the measurements and make sure that it would actually fit physically. I found out that the focal flange distance was identical on the two cameras. I did some measurements and found that the internal area on the Pocket 4K was much larger than the original Pocket Cinema camera. And incredibly, the sensor stack is identical at 2.4 millimeters. So to test this idea out, instead of going and buying one as they are quite expensive and I don't want to spend a load of money on something that may potentially not work on the camera, I decided to rent one. I actually managed to get one for 15 pounds to the day. I chose the EF mount version as that's the version that's kind of most practical for me. The other great thing about having the EF mount version is that it has the highest quality optics of any of the adapters Metabones did for the original Pocket Cinema camera. So taking a closer look at the speed booster, you can see that it has this insane depth to the rear element. It looks almost like the glass is gonna go right up to the sensor. It was really worrying putting it on the first time, but the EF mount does fit perfectly without touching the sensor at all. And even better still is that testing it out on the camera, we get full aperture control. We get perfect auto exposure, the only thing that doesn't work is the press to focus feature. So the main reason why I'm doing this video and the main reason why I think you guys are gonna be interested in this is that using this speed booster on the Pocket 4K, you're gonna have no crop between your kind of regular motion and also your high frame rate slow motion. So to quickly kind of visualize that, if you're shooting using a 0.71 times speed booster, using an APS-C format lens, you're gonna have your kind of APS-C field of view in your 4K DCI. But when you wanna go and do slow motion shots, you're gonna to have to crop into your sensor and that's gonna really kind of affect your field of view. But when you use this speed booster from the original Pocket Cinema camera, you get an almost APS-C field of view in your regular motion and also your high frame rate slow motion. So now we know that it works on the camera, you probably wanna see some test footage from the Pocket 4K with this speed booster. I only had this adapter for 24 hours, but I did manage to tag onto the back of a photography meetup that was happening here in Bristol. It was a really great way of just testing it out and getting an idea of how well it performs on the camera. For the majority of the shots are shooting at about f2.2 to f2.6, but sometimes going as wide as f1.8. And for the most part, you'll see that the images look really good even when shooting this wide open. Because there was quite limited lighting, we were just using street lighting, kind of lights on the bridges or on the side of buildings. And this looked really cool, especially tied in with kind of fire and some really good models and outfits. Obviously that sort of lighting isn't always ideal. So for the majority of the shots, I just had to tweak them to remove kind of color casts and other kind of bad properties from these lights. But luckily there's a load of kind of latitude in these 2.6K Q5 B-roll files. It was really easy to do skin qualifiers in the footage, also recover highlights or resaturate parts of the images that didn't have a lot of saturation, or just reduce luminance, kind of bring back down exposure. And even with these issues, the images generally looked very clean and cinematic, even after quite a lot of correction. Other shots like this one, where we had a daylight LED panel that was shooting through smoke. If you look at the log footage, there's actually no obvious color information in these shots. 
And I knew when I was filming these that I'd really want to push the grade. I'd really want to not go with a daylight look, make it kind of orange, make it almost look like it's kind of like a fiery smoke. And I was amazed with how much I could push these images, even at ISO 3200, and still get a very kind of usable looking image at the end of it. So one thing I did notice optically on the night was that when I was shooting wide open, paired with a strong light bouncing off my subject, it did start to cause a bit of kind of ghosting and blooming in the image. And this is pretty normal as you'd never expect your lens to perform too well when shooting wide open. But I did worry that because the speed boost is older, it may not perform as well as a newer one when shooting wide open. So when I got back in, I just set up a real kind of quick test shot just to compare the performance wide open between the 0.58 times and my much newer Mark II 0.71 times Metabone speed booster. And I was really pleased to see that the way both speed boosters render the lens wide open is near identical. So even though this test is pretty basic, we can kind of assume that this speed booster isn't going to be compromising the lens quality when it comes to shooting wide open. But at this point, you may be thinking, why are you going to all this effort to shoot at 2.6K when the camera does incredible 4K kind of out of the box? I do appreciate this is a pretty odd thing to do, but you can get great looking images at 1080p. And being able to shoot B-RAW at 2.6K with minimal crop could be a really interesting feature to bring to certain projects. There will always be projects where 4K is gonna be essential, whether you're shooting knowing you're gonna crop into that shot or whether you just want to capture at the highest possible quality. But other times, the benefit of shooting 2.6K with no slow motion crop is going to completely outweigh any benefits of shooting in 4K. Take a shoot I did in Turkey, for instance. This was a one-off night. I got asked to attend a henna party. I shot all that on the GH5S. And because there's no crop between the regular motion, the 50 frames a second, the 200 frames a second, I was really able to be quite flexible with the way I was recording. I wouldn't have been able to do that if the camera had a crop in every time I kind of wanted to go to slow motion. It would have really affected me. I would have to physically kind of reposition myself. And by the time I'd done that, in those sort of situations, the moment would just be gone. So with this speed booster on the Pocket 4K, it actually means that I'd be able to attempt to shoot like that, even though it only goes up to 120 frames and GH5S goes up to 240. That doesn't really matter. I, I could have worked around in that situation. I probably would have gone with the Pocket 4K as the images are so clean and they are much more flexible. The slow motion is much better. So this speed booster on the Pocket 4K, amazing. It's now become this like really interesting tool for me um, and really changes the way it kind of handles and works in different situations. The other really nice thing about shooting in Q5 2.6K was that the file sizes were tiny. <laughs> I shot two hours worth of footage and that equated to less than 64 gigabyte. For me, that's just incredible. The fact that I can go out for a shoot day, I can shoot at a really low compression quality. So get some really like punchy files um, and then still get a decent runtime from my cards is amazing. And then to top it off, the way that my computer handled that 2.6K Blackmagic RAW footage was insane. Scrubbing through the footage in Premiere, it was just instantaneous. Full res playback, I didn't need to do proxies at all. In comparison to the .mov files that come from the GH5S, it's just a completely different experience. But there are definitely downsides to set up. I'm not saying that it's kind of all perfect. The biggest one that I think a lot of people watching this video are going to think is that 2.6K is a really low resolution to be capturing your source files at. And when you compare 2.6K, 4K and 8K, it does look like there's a really big difference in resolution. But trust me, 2.6K is still more than high enough for digital cinema. The majority of theatrical releases from 2019 were shot in 2.8K ARRI RAW, from low budget, more experimental films like Nina Wu, up to significantly higher budget films like Knives Out. I appreciate the ARRI is in a completely different league to the Pocket 4K, but it does show that even at the highest levels of cinema, a 4K capture format is by no means a requirement. So what I would say is try not to worry too much about resolution. It's definitely an important factor, but it's not the most important factor when it comes to getting a cinematic looking image. So the next problem is that sampling a smaller part of the sensor means that your image noise is going to appear kind of larger. And it also means that it's not going to be able to resolve fine details as well as it could at 4K. 
So I did two different kind of test scenes. This first one is just an image noise comparison between shooting in 4K using the 0 0.71 times speed booster and shooting in 2.6K using the 0 0.58 times speed booster. ISO 100 and 400 both look really good, hardly any noise at all in either the 2.6K or the 4K. Even on the 1080p window, the noise isn't too noticeable. Going up to ISO 1250, this is where you're gonna to start to see a tiny bit more noise. The 2.6K shot doesn't look as good. You can see there's some shadow noise going on that is starting to deteriorate the footage quite a bit. Then by the time you get to ISO 3200, there is a significant increase in noise. But like you saw from the shots I was getting at the photography meetup, you can shoot at ISO 3200 and still get a very clean looking image. But you would definitely find that noise is going to be more problematic at ISO 3200. So for the next test, this shot is just of a camera dial. But this camera dial is incredibly kind of detailed. There's a lot of texture in the metal. And this is going to be a really hard shot for any camera to capture. Any in-camera compression is just going to kill details really quickly. Combining that with shooting at a lower resolution definitely isn't going to do you any favors. This is definitely where 4K resolution helps a lot to preserve all the fine details in the image. And not to say that 2.6K isn't detailed. Obviously, with no crop, looking at them side by side, the two do look very similar. And I think by the time we've gone for YouTube compression, even if you're watching this back in 4K, I doubt you're going to notice much difference between the two shots. So the last downside for me is that using this speed booster, your lenses aren't going to be as wide as they would be when shooting 4K using a 0 0.71 times speed booster. There's only a small amount of difference in it, but it does mean your wide angle shots won't be as wide with this setup. The really interesting thing is that I did a few tests like on a white backdrop, really testing it out to make sure there's no vignetting. And if Blackmagic did do a 2.8K 16 by nine recording mode instead of the 2.8K kind of four by three recording mode, you'd almost achieve a perfect APS-C aspect ratio with no vignetting or light loss at all. And while we're looking at the 2.8K mode, I would also like to say that on all my lenses, I was able to cover the full 2.8K square anamorphic window using this speed booster. And just so you can see it, the 4K DCI had issues on the corner of the frame on all the lenses that I tested. So to conclude this video a bit, yes, I'm definitely gonna get one. Um, I haven't got one yet. I'm gonna pick one up when one comes up on eBay. There's not a lot kind of in the UK kind of popping up at the moment. And thanks for watching this video. I know it was a bit of an odd video. Um, I'm talking about this kind of obsolete bit of hardware and how it may be kind of useful to you on your Pocket 4K. Hopefully for some of you, this will kind of prove to be some useful information and it could kind of transform the way you use your Pocket 4K in certain situations. Anyway, thanks for watching this and hopefully see you guys in the next one.